Welcome back. Uh, in this video, we're going to analyze the graph of a slightly more complicated rational function. Uh, this particular question asks us to analyze the graph of x cubed minus 125 over x squared minus 100. And again, for rational functions, we want to write them in their simplified form, so we want to factor both the numerator and the denominator. Uh, the, we'll start with the denominator. It's the easiest to factor. Notice that it's a difference of squares. It's a difference of x squared and 10 squared. And so we can write that as x plus 10, x minus 10. Okay, so that's fairly straightforward. The top is a difference of cubed, and you probably don't know the formula to factor a difference of cubes. Um, but you can hopefully recognize that 125 is 5 cubed, and then when x equals 5, that when x equals 5, this will be 0. And so we can use synthetic division to at least factor this thing real quick. And uh, when we do that, we want to say, I, well, I believe that 5 is a 0, so I'm going to say let c equal 5. And then x minus c will be x minus 5 is the factor that I'm looking to factor out. All right, and so we'll use synthetic division to find out what the remaining uh, quadratic is that I would get when I divide out x minus 5 from this polynomial. Uh, Writing the factors down to use synthetic division, you need to include 0. So there's 0x squared and 0x up here. And then minus 125. And for, again, synthetic division, it's multiply and add. It's fairly straightforward. It's not as hard as the uh, polynomial long division we're about to do in a little bit. 5 times 1 is 5. Add 5. 5 times 5 is 25. 25. Add, that's 25. 5 times 25 is 125. Add, I get 0. And so now I know I can write this as x minus 5 because 5 is a 0. And then what I'm left with as a residual is x squared plus 5x plus 25. And uh, what you'll find is the other two zeros of this are complex. This particular quadratic is prime. I encourage you to graph this on your calculator, and you'll find that it doesn't cross the x-axis. Uh, so there are no other real zeros. There's only one real zero when x equals negative 5. I mean, when x equals 5. It's useful at this point to note that for my... Um, for my uh, x-intercept, y equals 0, I now know that's x equals 5. The point 5 comma 0 is one of my intercepts, and I got that from doing this factoring. Right. We can also very quickly, let's calculate our y-intercept. That means x is going to equal 0. That's going to be negative 125 over negative 100. Okay, and that's going to be 5 fourths, or 1.25. So we've now found two of our key intercepts. Those are useful pieces of information. Looking at our domain restrictions here, we factored this down here. And note, x can't be negative 10, right? Negative 10 is the 0 associated with x plus 10. And x can't be 10, right? So those are our two domain restrictions. This function is defined. It's perfectly good everywhere else. We can plug in everything. We have these two domain restrictions here. And because those aren't common factors with our numerator, we know that these are vertical asymptotes. So we know that there are vertical asymptotes at x equals negative 10 and x equals 10. Those are two vertical asymptotes. So there are no removable discontinuities in this one. There's no holes poked in the graph. Now, the next thing we want to do is we want to analyze the end behavior. We're going to look for asymptotes, either a horizontal or a Blyck asymptote. Now, when the degree of the denominator is greater than the degree of the numerator, then for large values of x, this gets really, really big faster than that, and the, the horizontal asymptote is 0. When these have the same degree, 
we're going to end up with some constant value. It'll approach the constant value that would be the, the coefficients of the two dominant terms. In this case, the numerator is of higher degree than the denominator. So we're going to have what's called a slant asymptote. And to analyze and find the equation of the, the line that this looks like for large values of x, we're going to need to do polynomial long division. And so we're going to divide, and we're going to rewrite this rational function, uh, r of x. We're going to rewrite it as a polynomial plus a residual rational function, where this is the remainder over um, the denominator, I guess we'll call it. Okay, and so what we're going to find is this denominator will be of higher degree than the remainder. So for large values of x, this will go to zero, and it'll look like this polynomial that we're left with, this, this particular line. And we want to find the equation of that line. So we're going to do x squared minus 100 goes into x cubed, and we need to include, again, just like synthetic division, we need to include spaces for the x squared and x values if we need them. So plus 0x squared plus 0x minus 125. All right, so for polynomial long division, we just go in, we're going to say, what do I need to multiply x squared to get x cubed? And that will be x. x times x squared is x cubed x times negative 100 is minus 100x. Now I need to subtract this, but rather than try to subtract, I'm just going to change the sign and add. So when I do that, that goes to 0. 0 plus 0 is 0. I get 100x minus 125. This degree is lower than that, and so this is my remainder. So I can write this. This is my remainder. My remainder is 100x minus 125 over x squared minus 100. And you can see that as x gets really large, this x squared term dominates. This goes to 0. And my function starts to look just like the function y equals x. At this point, I'm, I'm going to put the frame on, on my sketch of my graph. Um, I'm interested in the points, if this is 10 and negative 10, there are vertical asymptotes there. I know that at the point 5, 0, right, there's, is on my graph. I know the point 0, 5 fourths, right, 5 over 4 is on my graph. And then this is my quick sketch of the line. This is x equals negative 10. This is the line y equals x, which is my slant asset. For large values of x, it looks like this line. All right. And then this is the line x equals 10. Those are vertical asymptotes. <clears throat> now, I want to see, plot maybe one or two more values of this function, and then I'll need to use my calculator to uh, estimate any minima or maxima that I get out of this particular function. Uh, I need to do my analysis. Again, um, we've already looked at, as x goes to infinity, this looks like x, but I want to see where it, where it ends up. Let's plot a point. Let's just calculate the value of a point uh, to, the, to the right of 10. Let's try 12, all right? And when x equals 12, I can say, let's call this thing h of x. I can say h of 12 is, uh, oh my word, 12 cubed is a big number that I can't think of off the top of my head. So I'm going to break out my calculator. All right, so enter. I'm going to go 12 times 12 times 12, you can do 12 to 1,728, right? So this is 1,728 minus 125 over 144 minus 100. So I'm going to subtract 125 
and then I'm going to divide that by 44, divided by 44, and I get 30, about equal to 36. So if this is the line y equals x, this is the point 12, 12. The value is 36. It's way above it. So what I see here is I'm going to have a graph that comes down. It's going to hit some minimum here, right? And then it's going to go back up. And then likewise, we can look at if I do the same thing for negative 12, or negative 20, let's say we do negative 20 over here, right? If I plug in h of negative 20, I'm going to get a number down here. Let's calculate h of negative 20. Uh, negative 20 is cubed is going to be negative 8,000 minus 125 is going to be negative 8125. Okay, and then 20 squared is going to be 400, negative 20 squared is still going to be positive 400 minus 100. So this is going to be negative 8125 over 300. So let's calculate that real quick. Um, if this were, it would be about 30, a little less than that, because if this were 9,000, that would be 30, so it would be a little less than 30, something in the, the negative 20s, but we'll calculate it here real quick. Uh, negative 8125 divided by 300. Negative 27, I'll buy that. That's about equal to negative 27. Okay, and so I've got um, this overall shape. knowing that I approach these two asymptotes here. Now, a couple of different ways you can do this. You can analyze and say, as I get close to negative 10 from the right, okay, um, as I get close to negative 10 from the right, this is still going to be positive, this is going to be negative, this is going to be negative, and this is going to be positive. Negative divided by negative is positive, and I'm going to be approaching a number that's getting really, 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 really um, small here. This is going to stay, as I approach negative 10, that's going to go to 0. And so this, is, this product is going to go to 0. And I'll be dividing by a number that's really close to 0. So this is going to approach positive infinity as I get there. Okay, I cross the x-axis at the point five zero, and then you can do the same analysis to see this goes down and approaches that way. It's got that S shape in the middle. I'm not exactly precise. We're just doing a sketch. And so this is the overall shape. It's got this. It's got this kind of flat shape that goes down. No maxima or minima in the middle here. The last thing I need to do is estimate the maxima and minima on my calculator. And so I'm going to need to put this graph into my calculator. A couple of different ways to do this. You can type it all on one line. I like to actually put the, the two functions separately and then write them in there. So I'm going to go x cubed arrow over minus 125. That's my numerator. Because potentially I might want to do some analysis on both numerator and denominator separately. And then this is x squared minus 100. All right. I don't really want to see them on my graph, so I'm going to arrow up here and shut their graphs off. But if I wanted to, I could graph them separately and do some analysis using my calculator there. Usually that would be more useful for more complicated polynomials. Um, at this point, y3 is just a y1 divided by y2. So I'm going to go vars, y variables, function, y1 divided by vars, y variables, function, y2. Okay, And so I can write my function. It's a little cleaner that way. I can see the numerator and the denominator. I don't have per crazy parentheses everywhere. All right. When I do my initial graph, I can see the middle part. I see what it does is it does that. I probably should have flattened this a little more as I came in and crossed there and then went down through 5. Uh, but it's got that S shape in the middle. 
what I don't see is I don't see the stuff associated with, I haven't zoomed out far enough. So I'm going to change my window, and we're going to zoom out a ways. We're going to go out to maybe negative 50 to 50 for my x values, we'll go by tens, and we'll do the same thing for the y values. And that, again, if you, you, we can imagine going across the diagonal of our screen, the line y equals x, and we want to see that, that characteristic shape and verify that it's where we think it is. So this is, y values will run from negative 50 to 50 by tens, and we'll look at that graph. And we see that for, as we get up here, this starts to look like the line y equals x, it hits this max and goes down, and then likewise. I can even graph, if you want to see it, let me graph the line y equals x. Right? If I come down here, it's, this is better if you had a color calculator where you could show the different colors, but I can actually graph the line y equals x. And you'll notice that for large values of x, this thing is starting to look like the line y equals x. And so the last thing that I need to do is estimate the maxes and the mins that occur here in my rational function. So we're going to calculate, let me calculate this local or relative maximum or turning point as our book sometimes calls it. The left bound will go with say 5, alright, that's fine, and then uh, it probably should go to the other side of 10. Let me, let me cancel that because 5 is on this one side of that, that uh, asymptote and it could potentially cause problems with the calculator. So I'm going to calculate the maximum. For the left bound, I'm going to pick 11, which is just to the right of my vertical asymptote y equals 10, right? So I'm going to pick something just to the right of that. All right, my right bound, uh, this should be fine, so 10, 20, 30 should be fine for a right bound, and a guess of 20 should work. And my calculator tells me, um, I calculated a maximum, I'm supposed to be doing a minimum over here. Note to self, the max on that interval is the end of the interval, right at 30, duh. Um, second, calculate. I'm calculating a minimum. Again, my left bound is going to be 11. My right bound is going to be 30. And my guess is going to be 20. All right, my calculator says that there is a uh, relative min at x is about equal to 16.89. And that value is h of 16.89 is about equal to 25.33. So when I'm at 16.89, my y value here is 25.33, give or take. All right, and we'll do the same thing here. We'll actually calculate a maximum now. Second, calculate. I want a maximum for. My left bound will go with negative 30. My right bound, I'll pick just this side of the, the vertical asymptote, so negative 11. And my guess will be negative 20. And it tells me that, again, there's a relative max at x is about equal to negative 17.72 and then h of negative 17.72 is about equal to negative 26.58 and so that's this particular point here this is approximately negative 17.22 comma negative 25.8 26.58, and that completes our graph. We've got our slant ob oblique asymptote that we calculated. We've got our vertical asymptotes. We've got our intercepts. We've got our relative maxima and minima estimated uh, using our calculator. And when we get to calculus class, we'll be able to take derivatives of this, set the derivative equal to zero, and actually calculate the exact values where those are zero. But for this class, that should do it.